I think there are some important questions that we as a society need to ask ourselves about exactly what, uh, on what basis is it that we want to draw the line between what's acceptable and what's not. Now, where I'd like to draw that line, essentially, is do no harm. Hello, and welcome to the fourth episode of Prostasia Foundation's podcast vodcast series, Sex, Human Rights, and CSA Prevention. Today, I'm very excited to be able to bring to you Dr. James Cantor. Dr. Cantor is a clinical psychologist and neuroscientist, best known for his research into the causes of pedophilia. Dr. Cantor is the director of the Toronto Sexuality Centre and has been editor-in-chief of the journal Sexual Abuse. Dr. Cantor, thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. So um, you're one of the first advisors that we took on board at Prostasia Foundation, and and we did that because of your expertise in a particularly controversial and difficult topic, which is that of of pedophilia. Um, So as in that capacity... Can you tell us a little bit about how someone becomes a pedophile? The uh, until the research really that was being done by my team and uh, uh, another team of researchers in uh, in Germany, the going theory for what caused somebody to be a pedophile was being a victim of a pedophile. Uh, it, it was kind of nicknamed the abused abuser hypothesis that if somebody was sexually abused as a child that that made them you know more likely to be a pedophile uh, themselves uh, and it kind of made sense you know for a lot of the 20th century you know according to the various psychological theories like learning theory and you know behaviorism and so on uh, but there was never really any evidence for it it just kind of sounded logical which it does uh, but uh, the research that I was doing and I say uh, other teams started doing was really on the basic biology. Was there something in the brain that made uh, a pedophile different from the brain of someone who was not a pedophile? Uh, it had already been uh, well established by that time that you know people are gay for you know, neurological differences in the brain. Well, pedophilia is the next large departure from typical sexual interest patterns and uh, I wanted to know what, you know, that was my scientific question what made them different and uh, as soon as we started looking we just found clue after clue after clue all suggesting that there was a biological specifically neurological component that something was different in basic brain structure and specifically in brain structures that develop before birth now, at first, we started finding this very indirectly. There were uh, differences in IQ patterns, differences in uh, memory functioning tests. But then we found more and more biological uh, stuff, you know, differences in uh, uh, minor differences in hair world pattern and attached earlobes versus not. There were two and a half centimeters, you know, shorter on average than people who committed offenses against uh, uh, offenses against adults. And the most dramatic thing that we found is that uh, is in handedness. In regular everyday people, you know, roughly eight to ten percent of uh, of men are uh, uh, non right handed, but it was well over thirty percent of the pedophiles. The only thing that influences whether a person is left or right handed is the basic hemispheric organization of the brain, and the only way that and that happens essentially, you know, at week eight, week ten, you know, of pre of gestation, pre long pre birth. So with that long line of clues, you know, then we started doing direct MRI evidence and have now actually seen the structures themselves. So the uh, short of it is that people seem to be born into whatever it is that uh, that they're into. What a person learns is the ability to control it or fails to learn the ability to control it. But this seems to be an inborn feature that they did not pick any more than the rest of us picked to be attracted to adults. We just figured it out as we went along. So can they learn the ability to control it or is there something in those brain differences that make it a compulsion, something that they can't control? The, yeah, no, it, there is not. Uh, the number one take home message I give absolutely any audience when I can is that pedophilia is not a synonym for child molestation. Pedophilia is the actual, genuine sexual interest in children, regardless of whether they ever act on it. Child molestation is the crime. 
you know, some of which is, of course, motivated by uh, genuine pedophilia, but mostly not. Only a minority of actual child molesters are genuine uh, are genuine pedophiles. So, you know, there are pedophiles who are not child molesters. There are child molesters who are not pedophiles. And, of course, there is, a, uh, is an overlap. But, uh, you know, discuss what goes with what we need to keep track of, of exactly which group we're talking about when. Now, there is absolutely there is nothing about pedophilia that makes a person, you know, not in control of what they're doing any more than anybody else. You know, just because a regular guy is attracted to adult women, you know, he is completely in control of his behavior. He does not rape every woman that he finds attractive. You know, ditto gay men, you know, gay men, you know perfectly fine, well in control, uh, well in control of their sexual behavior. So there's nothing about the structure of what the person is interested in that, you know, changes their ability to control themselves. There do exist in society people who cannot or will not control themselves, and they will, you know, go after and attack and do grossly inappropriate things with whatever it is they're attracted to. If they're attracted to, you know, women, these people are at risk to become rapists. If these people are attracted to men, you know, they will become antisocial within the gay community often. Uh, and if they're attracted to children, then those are the dangerous ones. But the danger is not exactly the pedophilia. The danger is this antisocial, psychopathic, you know, just break the rules, which is also in the brain. Hmm. So as I say, pedophilia itself is an independent of that. The dangerous people are dangerous, and whatever they're attracted to, those are the people who are going to end up their victims. So is there a relationship between psychopathy and pedophilia? Uh, it's tough to tell. I mean, I want to just naturally say uh, no, and there's no evidence, no strong, no meaningful evidence to say that there, uh, uh, there is a link. Uh, but when you get right down to it, that's not the kind of thing that we can't do a survey, you know, and get people, you know, willing to acknowledge their pedophilia and then give them whatever psychological test to find out if they're psychopaths. You know, the only way that the, we find these people is, you know, because they do commit crimes, sooner or later justice catches up with them, you know, and once they're in the system, you know, then they become available for, you know, uh, 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 to researchers like me. Uh, but there's no way to count how many are in society. We can only see the ones, you know, who, who did something wrong and came to our attention. So assuming that there is no such link between pedophilia and psychopathy, I suppose it means that um, a pedophile can be convinced in the same way as anyone else can be convinced not to, um, to, to commit sexual abuse. What are the techniques that you suggest we use with pedophiles? In fact, to I would say that's the default position. We really have every reason to believe that uh, uh, from the mindset of the pedophiles themselves, you know, they only figure out what's up as they grow older. When they're, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old and they get crushes on other 10, 11, 12 year olds, you know, so are their friends. Everything is, you know, there's nothing to notice. Uh, but when they start hitting, you know, 15, 16, 17, and they're still getting crushes on 10, 11, and 12-year-olds, that's when they start noticing something's wrong, something's very, very different. The by far most common reaction, I'll say natural reaction, is that's when they recoil. That's when they, you know, they, they start at a position of holding this in and controlling it, you know, very, very afraid of, you know, being labeled as one of them. Never mind, you know, again, from my own situation growing up gay, never mind, you know, trying to stay in the closet about being gay. My trip was simple next to what these people have to. So as I said, the, the default position for them is to control it in every way possible. Uh, the ones that we end up hearing about, the ones who commit crimes, are the ones who fail to do that. Uh, and they're uh, usually the ones who have had the least kind of supports in their environment for them to rely on. Uh, 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 one of the things that I take for granted at this part, just as part, uh, be, uh, as part of being a psychologist, is uh, people will do desperate things only when they feel the most desperate. So if somebody has resources and education, money, a family, you know, with who may or may not know what's going on them, if other spheres of life are going well, they will try to protect their life and not do anything that would put it at risk. 
if there's somebody who's not so lucky, you know, came from a family with chaotic or abusive uh, parents themselves, drug or alcohol problems, self-control difficulties in general, you know, ADHD, you know, whatever stack of issues, you know, that besets humans, from their point of view, life has fucked him over and he doesn't have a lot of willpower to, you know, control this one thing that he thinks might give him a moment's pleasure. He's dead wrong. But if we want to, you know, if we want to uh, really uh, meaningfully prevent people acting out, it's we want to prevent people from being in de desperate situations. Mm -hmm. We want them to be able to contact other people who are themselves dealing with pedophilia. So, you know, just to decrease the sense of isolation. Again, that's just another basic lesson we know from, uh, from psychology is that when people have a support network, social network, somebody to check in with and just remind themselves that they're not the only one in the world, they work harder to, be, uh, to behave themselves. They have somebody to behave themselves for. And I think we should be, you know, creating, uh, facilitating that, and making more and more venues for that uh, for that available. Mm -hmm. But uh, all of this is to start with uh, uh, the idea that uh, can they be taught control? They started in control, and the people who lack control, again, these are well-known entities, and they lack control the same way that anybody else who comes from really tough circumstances tends to have a harder time controlling themselves. Hmm. If the person also happens to be into whatever it is, pedophilia or some other sexual interest pattern, drugs, whatever it is, if this is a person with difficulty controlling themselves, they're going to pose a danger. So, but, uh, but as I say, really the danger here is people who have difficulty controlling themselves, yeah. it's not exactly the pedophilia yeah. itself. But when both happen, now, of course, we have an enormous problem. Well, can the lack of a sex life in itself be something that drives a person to commit a crime? Because someone who is sexually attracted to children, who doesn't want to harm children, is effectively going to be condemned to a, a life of celibacy. Um, is that in itself something that can cause problems in, in terms of their behavior? Or is there a way for them to have a satisfying sex life without abusing children? There's a range of what I've seen happen and what's possible, uh, and it, it's pretty individual. Uh, even though we say pedophile just as you know, chunk as if they're you know one uniform population, there's really uh, uh, it's much more helpful to understand uh, the mindset of these people uh, if we view uh, even the phrase that they use, uh, age of attraction. You know, so where, how old does a kid have to be where things kick in and how old is too old that they're not interested anymore? So for some people, it is, you know, the, the very strict, you know, medical definition is pre-puberty, so generally up to age 10. You know, so some people will say, you know, 8 to 10 is, is for pedophiles generally the most common, but there are people who are into toddlers. Uh, there are, of course, the hebophiles, you know, which is, you know, puberty age, you know, roughly uh, uh, 11 to 14. And very many are both of those ranges. You know, they, they like, you know, 8 to 14. And there are some people who will like, you know, early teens, 12, 13, up to 20. So for some people, it's not, you know, they can focus their energies and attention and genuine relationships to the upper end of that. But they also need to deal with some issues surrounding their attractions to the kids, but they have, you know, options. They are attracted uh, to adults enough that, you know, we, we can capitalize on that. They know this is inappropriate and can't go anywhere. Then there are other people who have adult partners who either, you know, kind of look, you know, uh, uh, slender, relatively uh, uh, hairless, uh, have personality features that are a little bit childlike, and everything is done through fantasy. With a willing partner, you know, they'll put on, you know, pajamas and onesies and they will just act out the fantasy the same way that anybody else acts out the fantasy, but it, you know, has a, has a, a deeper meaning for, uh, for them. The people who, of course, are, uh, 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 have the uh, most to grapple with are the ones whose uh, sexual attractions are restricted to, you know, puberty age children, pre-pubertal children, you know. 14, uh, uh, 14 and under. These are the people for whom there's no alternative. Now, uh, 
there's some legitimate questions about, you know, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. And I think there are some important questions that we as a society need to ask ourselves about exactly what, uh, on what basis is it that we want to draw the line between what's acceptable and what's not. Now, where I like to draw that line essentially is do no harm. If somebody can demonstrate that this is actually harmful, yep, out the window, that is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. That is, you know, our duty to, to, uh, 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 to ensure the safety of people in it. Got it. But most of the stuff that people are talking about now, uh, people are talking about banning materials because it makes them uncomfortable. Because it makes them uncomfortable. I understand that line of thinking, but I'm a free speech junkie. It's, you know, somebody's discomfort is not a strong enough reason to, to ban something. And there's no, uh, now uh, I'm thinking about uh, uh, sex dolls, life size sex dolls, but, you know, custom designed to look like a kid. And it's not difficult to see in the future, you know, sex robots, same thing, designed to look like a kid. You know, so did these count as child pornography? Uh, what the problem with child pornography is that it victimizes the subject of the, of the porn. You know, so, so, you know, it's that kid is not able to consent, you know, or provide informed consent. But when we're talking a lump of latex, a sex toy, really is that who are we protecting you know it's we feel icky we feel uncomfortable but as i say that's not a demonstration of harm mm -hmm. if there were evidence saying that you know linking the use of sex toys to some kind of crime okay you know but you know, no, but we had no such evidence mm -hmm. and what we can imagine however and there's no evidence for this opposite side however it's easy to imagine that just having a sex toy is something to play with take the edge off you know a masturbation lump of latex like everybody else has take the edge off of sex drive enough for these people to you know make it easier for them to control themselves that's a perfectly legitimate hypothesis too so even though everybody's kind of reflexive, like, oh, we have to ban these things because they think it will encourage, uh, no, we can, you know, we can imagine the opposite just as much. Yeah. So, James, you've taken the controversial position that non-offending pedophiles should be able to defend their interests um, under the LGBTQ banner. What's your rationale for that? Uh, I think that's a bit of an overstatement of what I said. We're talking about, you know, a tweet. Uh, so I not, neither want to understate it nor overstate it. The, the, the thread, as I recall it, was that uh, somebody uh, was advocating for, you know, just basic humane treatment of people who, you know, are born with a sexual interest pattern that uh, they didn't ask for. Uh, and But the person was saying, you know, we're, we're not asking to be part of the LGBT spectrum. I just happened to have so, uh, seen that. And because I get to speak as an openly gay man, I said, you know, actually, I think we should be adding the P to LGBTQ, blah, 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 blah. Really just on the basic principles of what makes sexual minority rights sexual minority rights. Now, and, you know, from then on, of course, you know, I'm a notable enough figure. And then that caught, you know, the conservative sites and so on, um, you know, and everybody turned it into, you know, my saying something that I was not saying. Uh, what I keep pointing, uh, uh, keep pointing out, and again, because I'm openly gay, I'm one of the only people who can say this kind of thing without just immediately being written off as a... Uh, uh, as being homophobic and saying, oh, you know, here's here they go again, you know, trying to uh, trying to say that pedophilia is like homosexuality, again because I have the very strange position from from which I get to speak on uh, on a topic like this. I actually get to present the idea in a way that few people can. Now, as I say, the basic principles for what makes sexual minorities a sexual minority and what makes civil rights for sexual minorities. You know, what gets somebody in that rainbow, from my point of view, is that uh, people deserve the right to express whatever their sexuality is, so long as it doesn't harm anybody else. And these people deserve, you know, the right to, you know, jobs and, you know, freedom from harassment and freedom, you know, uh, non-discrimination in housing, get it, and all the usual stuff unrelated to their, you know, sexual minority status. 
people were, you know, forbidden things because they were gay, because they were lesbian, and that ultimately is the thing that holds all of these people together. One cannot take for granted that this is going to be a regular, everyday man and women, you know, 2.3 children kind of a life. That's what puts somebody... Well, pedophilia matches all of that. What we as sexual minorities are pointing out to everybody is that it doesn't matter if it makes you uncomfortable, you know, we deserve these rights. Well, all anybody's doing by saying, oh no, we don't want pedophilia to be, you know, part of it. Well, no, that is doing unto others as was done unto you. You are committing exactly the crime that you were faulting the others for. What exactly makes them separate except that Oh, I shouldn't be stigmatized. They're stigmatized, but I'm okay. Ah, that isn't how it works. You either work against stigma or you don't. You just don't. Uh, that is the difference between genuine activism, genuine principled advocacy, and just hitting the hip fashion, sticking it to the man, you know, and just, you know, expressing adolescent rebellion. And so I, I, I think the, the provocative nature of the idea is that it really does call into question how many people who think of themselves as liberal thinkers are actually thinking like liberals rather than just kind of following the lead, you know, and just doing whatever is in whatever is fashionable amongst their peeps. I think that's actually what uh, uh, many many people find alarming. What many people on the left find alarming about the statement. Well, isn't there a legitimate point, though, that uh, if we did um, provide in law some of these protections against discrimination in employment and so on, that we could be bringing people who do have a, a greater than average likelihood of committing a sexual offence against a child into, uh, into workplaces where they might be in close contact with children? Isn't that a legitimate point? Uh, that is. If we uh, once that can be demonstrated, that that could be a a, a, a legitimate uh, a legitimate social interest. I mean, uh, for legitimate reasons of harm, potential foreseeable harm, yeah, that that's okay. I can see that, uh, but that's not really the same level of the landlord doesn't just want your uh, just doesn't want your type around here. Yeah, you know, or I just don't want to be associated with you. Make us look. Uh, you don't get. A float in the parade, eh, right? Well, so I, I I don't mean to fight for a particular extreme. Yeah, I'm just saying that you know, what we do for each of these groups is accommodate, you know, as is possible. But there are reasonable limitations to that accommodation. Uh, for example, people deserve to express whatever BDSM kink kind of interest that you know that they want. Have a good time with consenting partners. It is true, though. You know, so yeah. just because they're getting slapped or giving a real slap, no, 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 that doesn't change. Right? No, there are meaningful social protections that can be uh, that can be in place, but the kind of uh, uh, limitations that are reasonably, you know, discussed for an asexual is going to be completely different from somebody who's deep into BDSM and you know, twenty four seven DS relationships. You know, the the what one of these, you know needs a little reasonable scrutiny where how much trouble is an asexual going to get in you know it's just kind of basically the idea is remember that they exist too so I, I understand everything you're saying but like isn't it true that we're not as a society we're not at the point where most people would have a problem with a landlord saying we don't want your type here um it, can you foresee a future in which society is okay with that society you can reasonably think about any subtle or profound issue. Uh, uh, any line of thinking that doesn't fit into a tweet is just not fit for airtime anymore. I, the day of books and long discussions, uh, now it is just, you know, what's the most radical thing you can say in order to get the, the likes and the retweets? It, 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 so I, it's, uh, so as much as the, it, this particular issue is, of course, provocative, and you know, really, all I'm doing is taking what we now know, you know, scientifically. These people didn't pick this, and it will not change over the course of life. Just like a sexual orientation, everything else. Let's just take that to its logical conclusion. Therefore, dot 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 dot, and everybody keeps coming to the same conclusions. But some people are having an emotional reaction to, you know, letting go of what 
was a very familiar uh, uh, was a very familiar good evil story now it's because society at, you know at the moment is designed just of the blackest of blacks the whitest of whites yeah. you know seeing some kind of profound line of thinking and you know keep your emotions at bay and just think about this logically for a couple of minutes a, a, a topic this emotionally laden right i it, it's there are few audiences able to put their emotions aside enough in order to think about this logically, which to me uh, is probably the saddest part of the story, or one of the saddest parts of, uh, of the story, is that we have in front of us the ability to do so much better when it comes to prevention just by taking the basic scientific conclusion in front of us and taking it, taking it to its conclusion, but people have become... Uh, in our f have become almost self indulgent in their irrational uh uh in their irrational approach to this issue to yeah. just froth themselves up almost like you know they're they're kind of uh, it's like I'm watching literally preaching to the choir where at, at just the anger is so understandable but so entirely prevents us from thinking logically about how actually to fix the problem mm -hmm. So I think what we're trying to do, and one of the benefits that you bring to Prosthesia Foundation with your involvement, um, is to be able to try and, um, as difficult as it is for people, um, to try and set out the facts in, in a way that um, uh, is um, separated out from that gut emotional disgust that people feel, um, and to do so in a way that furthers the cause of child sexual abuse prevention. So. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to, to talk with us today. Is there anything else you'd like to leave our audience with? Any resources that they can follow up on to learn more or, or any other you know, final tips you'd like to leave them with? Oh, uh, really the best place is really just follow me on, uh, uh, on Twitter, probably uh, at James Cantor PhD. You know, at any time I find something interesting on the topic or other interviews, I, um, that, that's where I send it out from. Uh, but no, it's my absolute delight to be here, and I'm really, really proud to be associated with the foundation. And uh, it's, uh, there are a few instances where people, you know, can genuinely work on solving this problem, and it's not by getting angry at it. it it's a, a pleasure to participate in rational approaches. Well, thank you very much again for joining us, and uh, and all the best in your future endeavors. Great. Take care. Thanks. And thank you for watching this episode. If you'd like to make sure you don't miss future installments, please make sure you subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, you can do that by clicking the logo here. There's also a link for you to donate to Prostasia Foundation because we do depend on your donations. Thank you very much again for watching and we'll see you next time on Sex, Human Rights and CSA Prevention.